in the right desktop. So here we go. I'm hoping everyone can see the large slide and, uh, and not the presenter view. Is that the case? So, you know, yes. is that right? Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, Thank that's you. right. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so yes, my talk is um, English local accentism, global accentism. Um, now, of course, you've probably spotted that I'm British. And uh, so there is definitely going to be a British angle to this talk. Um, but I look forward to discussing um, other aspects with you um, later on when we come to the discussion. So in this talk, I'm going to cover um, who speaks English, accentism as a local and global phenomenon, uh, performance accents and implications for English language teachers. So just to start with, if you're thinking about a British English speaker, um, do they look like this, for example? Is this what a British English speaker looks like? Um, horror of horrors, do they look like this? This is one of our very right wing politicians um, waving a British flag there. Who is this speaker of English? Who's the person that people visualise when they think about a speaker of English? And what connotations does that have for how you feel about speakers of English? It's widely accepted that there are around 350 million speakers of English as a first language, about 450 million second language English speakers, and about 1 billion speakers who use English as a contact language, and that latter is expanding, it's growing a lot. So if we think about all of these different people who speak English around the world, actually, when we think about what an English speaker looks like, we should really be thinking more like this. Um, English speakers come from all walks of life, all areas of the world, um, all different ethnicities and so on. So thinking that a speaker of English is a particular kind of person, if that's the case, if people do visualize um, an English speaker as looking like a, a white person, for example, then that really is not very representative of the way that speakers of English look. So I want to focus specifically on these two groups here um, in this talk. And I'm gonna start by looking at um, English in England, um, and then move on to different sorts of varieties spoken around the world. Um, we're not going to get into too much detail about the 450 million second language speakers, but there will be some discussion of accent prejudice um, as, as observed by those speakers. So to start with, I'm going to show you an image. And if I flash this image up to anybody who is British, um, usually there is an argument about how this thing is pronounced. So let's see if it's going to let me go onto that slide. OK, here we go. Right. How do you pronounce this thing? This might not be a problem in the States or you might have a completely different word for it in um, in the United States. But in Britain, this is either a scone, which rhymes with cone. My slides are not working properly. A, a, a scone that rhymes with cone or a scone that rhymes with gone. And if I ask British people, which of these do you pronounce? Um, when I have open days, for example, and I have parents and, and their children come, um, prospective students, there are usually arguments about how this word is pronounced because people have very strong views about how this word is pronounced. Now, interestingly, this is such a, an important and interesting word in British English that there has actually been research done on how this word is pronounced in the British Isles. So if we move on to the next slide, this is the great scone or scone map of Britain. And uh, what it's showing us is that if you are in an orange area of the country, then you will pronounce this to rhyme with gone. So you will say scone. If you are in a green area of um, the British Isles, you will pronounce this to rhyme with cone, as in scone. And we can see that if you're in um, the Republic of Ireland, for example, you're very likely to say scone. If you're in Scotland and the north of England, you're very likely to say scone. But if you are in the rest of England, the sort of Midlands, uh, North Midlands, and then um, the South, uh, etc., um, you're more likely, well, actually, it's a bit of a bit of a mixture. So you could say scone or scone. And we've got some areas of the country where people are more likely to say um, scone. So for example, around the kind of Sheffield, Chesterfield area, that, that 
bluey green bit there um, and just to the east of that. Um, and then we also have this interesting area um, which is down in the corner here. Uh, now this is Devon and Cornwall. Cornwall is the furthest west and Devon is the, um, the eastern county there out of those two highlighted. And they even disagree about which way you put the jam and the cream on the scone or scone. Um, but if you are from Cornwall, you're more likely to say scone. And if you're from Devon, you're more likely to say scone. This area of the country is going to crop up again when we look at different patterns of accents and dialects in a moment, actually specifically accents, we're not going to be looking at dialects. So I am going to show you data from two surveys of English. One of them is the survey of English dialects, which was done in the 1950s and 60s, early 60s. And uh, actually this has been revived at the University of Leeds now. Um, and the other one is from Adrian Lehmann's English Dialects app, which is where the map with the scone or scone data came from that I just showed you. Incidentally, I, I say scone, but uh, that's entirely consistent with that map. Um, I'm going to show you some comparisons where we're looking at um, accents in um, England in the 1950s and then accents in the, um, well, from 2016 onwards. So we're going to have a look at that. So the first map we've got here is um, England in the 1950s. So we're not looking at um, Ireland or Wales or Scotland here. Um, so this is data from the SED, Survey of English Dialects. And we can see that there is um, a definite line here. And what we're looking at is whether people pronounce the word A-R-M as arm or arm. Uh, so if you are um, a North American English speaker, you are more likely to say arm, um, and there's a reason for that. Um, but in Britain these days, we don't generally say arm. Um, we tend not to do that. We, we tend to pronounce it as um, arm, which is, sorry, I'm hitting a problem with my, uh, with my moving my slides on there. Uh, we tend to pronounce it as arm. And you can see looking at the map from 2016, um, that this is the case. So mostly green is indicating that people say arm and orange is indicating that people say arm. Now, if we look at the map from the 1950s, we can see that there's a very strong boundary there. We can also see that there are some areas of the country um, where uh, interspersed, if you like, in England, um, which are kind of cut off from the other arm parts where you would expect to say that. And I am just again going to draw your area down here in the southwest, which is a, a more likely place for people to say arm now in. Area. Um, is inhabited by the Anglo-Saxons. The shaded area is the Danelaw, so that's where we've got the invaders um, from Denmark and the Viking invaders and so on, who settled late. Um, however, in the southwest area, the Anglo-Saxons would have pronounced the R sound. So we've got this um, situation from um, 900 AD uh, and you can see that there is this very, very clear line here. Now this is actually um, Watling Street. It's a well-known Roman road that goes across England from, um, well, basically from Canterbury to Chester. Um, so from the southeast to um, just above Wales there. And uh, this is now the A5 road. Um, but we've got this line here, which is very clearly cutting those two um, areas off, areas of the country off there. Um, derives from an Anglo-Saxon term for, um, basically for foreigners, something like that. Um, and why these regions Um, to the Vikings and the Danes, um, they pushed the indigenous peoples out to um, these areas of, of the country, of Britain. 
So um, there was either intermarriage or people moved away to those areas. So we can already see that we've got a situation of settlers here going on in, um, in Britain, where we've got invaders from Europe coming over, um, deciding they were going to have the land um, and then pushing out the indigenous peoples into other areas of the country. And that would mean that um, the varieties of English that are um, affected by those areas um, have have got features of the languages that were spoken in those regions of the country. So we've got these um, situations where the, um, the indigenous populations were pushed into the west side of, um, of England in this case. Now we've also got a couple of other areas here, um, which I'm just going to draw your attention to there. Um, so Northumbria, um, just around the Hadrian's Wall area in the northeast, um, and then Cumbria, which is just above um, Wales there. We've got these areas here which were not settled by the Danes. And if we go back to this map from the 1950s, first of all, you'll see that we've still got this boundary here. Um, and this is comparing around 900 AD in England with the 1950s accent situation. Um, and then we've also got these areas here, um, which are still very, very similar. So what would have happened is that people just didn't move around very much. Once people had settled, so once the Anglo-Saxons had settled, once people had been, uh, the indigenous peoples had been pushed into the um, West, West Wales and Wales areas, when the Vikings had arrived and so on, and once people had settled and once they'd set up their settlements, they just didn't move around very much. You tended to stay where you were. Um, it would have been very difficult to travel great distances, unlike now. Um, so you would have largely stayed in your local community. Um, you would have had fealty to a local king, usually, or a chieftain. Um, and you would have maybe gone to market, but that wouldn't have involved too much traveling. People tended to stay home, stay in their communities, work the land, etc. And in these sorts of situations, remembering that the population was very sparse in 900 AD, you'd get these accents um, developing and this tribalism developing. And if you look at these two maps, you can see from the point of view of pronouncing or not pronouncing the R sound in arm um, or arm, you can see that there wasn't very much movement at all at this time, uh, between this time and the 1950s. Whereas if we look at the 2016 map, we can see that now most of England, people will say arm, not arm. Um, although we have got these pockets down here in the southwest, and also we've got a very resistant little group around Bristol there, where people have a very recognisable accent. So why have we got these changes now? Why suddenly after the 1950s did things start to change? Um, well, Transport links are a lot to do with it. Transport links leading to changes in workplace and travel, whether we're talking about the road or the rail. And uh, we can see, for example, here that this is an image of the M6 motorway in 1969. Um, this is the motorway that runs uh, past Birmingham um, in the West Midlands in Britain. And um, I mean, I, uh, the motorway near where I grew up is called the M2, that's in Kent. And um, in the 1970s, early 1970s, my dad used to take me as a trip to go and have a look at the motorway because it was still quite something um, and go and have a look at the motorway services. So this is anyway what this looks like in 1969. If we compare that with an image of the M6 motorway now, it looks like this. So even between the end of the 60s and now, there is much more traffic, much more movement around the country. Um, cars are more affordable um, we're able to move goods, we're able to do commerce using the roads and the rails and, and so on. Um, so there's much, much more movement and people are able to commute for work and mix around um, with, um, with people from different regions of the country. And this just wouldn't have been the case in, well, certainly not in 900 AD um, or very much in the 1950s. We've also got technological development. So this is an image of um, a 1950s living room. I think actually this might be an American living room. But in any case, um, in the 1950s, in the early 1950s, the Queen um, of England, Queen Elizabeth II, had her coronation and it was televised and people went out and bought televisions specifically so that they could watch this event. 
Um, so suddenly everybody had a television in their, or not everyone, but a lot of people had televisions in their houses where they never would have had them before. You would have had the radio, newspapers and magazines, um, also um, cinemas, people would go to um, the cinema to watch films and see newsreels and so on. Um, and in televisions on, and on the radio, for the news announcers, for continuity announcers, they tended to have very standard type voices. And if you heard regional voices, it would have been um, something like um, a soap opera, a Coronation Street is a very well known one in Britain, which is set in the north um, west of England. And, um, and so it would have been those sorts of programmes. But for the news announcers, for the people um, doing the bit between the programmes, they would have had very standard accents. Now, of course, we have access to media from all over the world all the time. It's really difficult to not listen to people from all over the world. So we're hearing many more people. And this, again, is going to contribute to our understanding of different accents and different varieties. And the fact that um, American English is an influence on British English, for example, can partly be attributed to the fact that we have American English movies. Um, we have a lot of American um, input on, on media on um, social media, on YouTube, etc. Um, and people are um, picking up different sorts of accent features based on the popularity of certain things. Now, um, accent prejudice is learned. It is not something which you are born with, just like, uh, well, actually, you're born being frightened of snakes, but you're not being, you're not born being prejudiced against people or against the way that they speak. And there are some common misconceptions about accents which are negative. So one of them is that they are always regionally based. This is certainly not the case. In, in Britain, for example, the accent RP, received pronunciation, is a non-regional accent. It's spoken by people who are educated in a particular group of schools, which happen to be around the sort of London, Oxford kind of region of the world. But these people, are based all over the country. So they're not regionally based. So the idea that accents are always based in specific regions is not necessarily true, although it is partially true. Another misconception is that they are low or substandard varieties. So if you speak um, English with a, um, a regional type accent, an accent which is frowned upon, um, then this is not um, it, it's not a good variety. It's um, rubbishing English. I've, I've um, heard people say that somebody who speaks in a particular accent should have their mouth stuffed with nails um, because they're just ruining the language and so on. It, it really is not the case that varieties are low or substandard. This is a value judgment based on things that are perpetuated through the media and through prejudices. Also that they're rustic varieties associated with the working classes and rural areas. Again, this is really not the case. They are not necessarily rustic. Um, they are associated with all different classes, all different walks of life, all different areas of the country. And remember, I'm, I'm kind of specifically talking about Britain here, but you could apply that elsewhere too. Also that they're old forms that are now dying out. Now we've, we've seen in the maps that I've shown you that some accent features have um, died out largely in most of England. So pronouncing R um, at the end of a word or um, before a consonant, for example. Um, but we have new varieties of English which are forming not only across the world, but also in Britain. We see that there are varieties like multicultural London English, for example, which is a new form and definitely not a form that's dying out. And finally, that they are not codified. They have no observable rules. And again, this really isn't the case. Um, languages have got to have rules to work to be understood. They are logic, basically. If I deviate too far from something, then it's going to be difficult for people to understand me. So if I'm in a particular community and I'm using a particular accent, that accent has got to be um, workable in that particular community. It might not be something that can be used very easily outside the community, but it must have rules in order to work in any kind of community at all. To, so, so to say they're not codified, that they don't have rules, is completely untrue. So these are just some misconceptions about accents, and they tend to be um, negative. People tend to have these 
um, prejudices against accents. Um, and part of this is tribal. We've still got these tribes um, that were um, formed years ago, hundreds of years ago, when people settled around the countries and, and had uh, and had these um, loyalties to particular groups. And we still see this with um, loyalties to other local um, activities. So, for example, football teams, very, very strong local loyalty, Manchester United, for example, Aston Villa um, from the Birmingham area. So we, we see that we get these very, very strong loyalties associated with activities and these breed prejudice. People think that um, if you're not in that group, then um, they, they judge you negatively. Now, something that surprised me that came up recently in The Guardian was an article on students um, who said because of the way they spoke, they were made to feel out of place at university. And uh, this particular headline here, this is um, a student called Nina White, um, who basically said that um, she was felt uh, she was made to feel like she didn't belong and that people were surprised that she had managed to get a first class degree because she didn't speak with a standard variety of British English, which is just extraordinary. The idea that we're saying that if you don't have this variety of English, you are not able of achieving well in academia is, is just absolutely ridiculous. And this was just one example from um, a whole list of students who were saying that they were made to feel like they didn't belong um, at prestigious universities in the UK. I think that's absolutely shocking. Um, now, this person I'm showing you here is the UK Home Secretary Priti Patel. Um, Priti Patel doesn't have politics that I'm particularly happy with or share. Um, she's extremely right wing in many ways. Um, but she is criticised for her accent. When people are criticising this person, they lay into her because she has a particular accent feature. And uh, she sounds quite London sounding. Um, but what she does, which people have picked on, is instead of saying something like saying, she says saying, she does that kind of thing, um, saying and doing and speaking, she, she does that. Um, she is criticised roundly for that, but it seems to be a veil for something else. It seems to be that she is picked on um, because she's a woman um, and uh, for um, background race kind of issues as well. This is a very, very complex issue. But one of the interesting things is that this gentleman, who is Dominic Raab, who is the UK Foreign Secretary, um, has also a very marked speech pattern. He has something called a labiodental R. So instead of saying right and wrong, he'll say right and wrong, this sort of thing. He doesn't tend to be criticised for his speech. And is this because he is a white bloke with an otherwise quite upper class sounding accent. Um, something else that I was asked to comment on recently uh, was the accent of the royal children. Um, now here they are, I'll just play this to you and, uh, and just have a listen to their accents and then I'll, I'll tell you what the conversation was about. There we go. Hello, David Attenborough. What animal do you think will become extinct next? Well, let's hope there won't be any, because there are lots of things we can do when animals are reduced to in danger of extinction. We can protect them. Uh, about 40 years ago, uh, I was with some mountain gorillas in central of Africa. Mountain gorillas uh, were then very, very rare. There's only 250 of them left. And we showed pictures of them on television around the world. And people thought how terrible it would be if these became extinct. So they subscribed lots of money and lots of people came to help. And now there are over a thousand of them. So you can save an animal if you want to, and you put your mind to it. People around the world are doing that because animals are so precious. So let's hope there won't be any more that go extinct. Hello, David Attenborough. I like spiders. Do you like spiders too? I love spiders. I'm so glad you like them. I think they're wonderful things. Why is it that people are so frightened of them? I think it's because they've actually got eight legs 
which is much more than us. And if you've got eight legs, you can move in any direction. So you'll never be quite sure which way that spider's going to go. Is it going this way or that way? So people don't like them, and they don't like them hairy legs either. But spiders are so clever. Have you ever watched one trying to build its web? That is extraordinary. How does it make this sort of circular web like that with attached to trees on either side or bits of vegetation? How do they do it? Try and watch and see how they do it. It's marvelous. What animal do you like? I think I like monkeys best. Okay, now I'm going to stop um, Mr. David there. The, the children, um, this video was uh, sent out by the, um, by the royal family, by Prince William and, um, and Princess Catherine. Um, and it was posted on their Twitter account. And I was contacted by a journalist who said they wanted me to comment on this because they didn't think the children sounded very posh. Um, which I think is extraordinary. I mean, you know, enjoy the kids. They're really cute. Um, we've got Prince George. He's the first one. He's seven years old. Uh, Princess Charlotte, who's five and a half, and Princess Louis, who's two and a half, bless him. So they wanted me to talk about their accent features. Well, first of all, to say anything about the accent features of a child is quite tricky because they're still developing their phonology. So Prince George is probably the person who's got the most formed adult-like phonology. And the only thing I could really say about Prince George um, was that he had a vocalized L when he was talking about animal. So he does that sort of thing. Um, and so I, I said, you know, this is a feature that you get in a, in a variety of English called estuary English. And it was noted earlier on in William and Harry's um, childhood and adolescence that they had features that were like this as well. Um, and so what did the newspapers do with it? They, <laughs> they blew it out of all proportion. I mean, I was really shocked to see these headlines. They just made a few comments about accent features. And they're saying, royal boys' accents are more Jamie Oliver than Lord Snooty, and Princess Charlotte speaks the Queen's English, but George and Louis have more unusual accents. Um, and one even claiming that Prince George has picked up the estuary accent of Ricky Gervais and Jamie Oliver. And I, I absolutely didn't even mention those people at all, but um, clearly the journalist went away and looked up estuary English and, and found these people. So th this, is, this is something which is always on the mind of British people. Accents, the way that you speak, it totally defines you. Um, it's really quite shocking and horrifying. So one question is, who has an accent? Um, and in fact, it's everyone. If you speak any kind of spoken language, you have got an accent. So saying that uh, we have um, people who do um, accent removal, for example, it's just not possible. You're just changing a speaker from one accent into another. Um, and on that note, I'm just gonna say something about performance accents. So, um, what I'm going to talk about here is an ex example where um, people complained because quite a well-known um, TV personality and singer in Britain um, sang the national anthem at the British Grand Prix in 2015 and um, apparently sang it in an American accent, uh, which was um, actually not the case. So I was again uh, contacted to comment on this. And I will play you the video and you can hear that. Um, well, let, let me know what you think is going on here when we have our discussion a bit later on. Is this person singing in an American accent? Here we go. Said her victorious, happy and glorious, long to Okay, bless her. So that's, uh, sorry about all these other things coming up here. That's Alicia Dixon. And um, she was really, you know, oops, really, really giving it something. Um, and so was she speaking in an American, was she singing in an American accent or not? Um, now I looked at this and the only thing that I could think of that was at all, even vaguely American English sounding 
was the guard sort of thing that she does there. But you're going to get this. If somebody is singing on a sustained note um, and is singing that bow, then you and you're going to unround your lips when you're singing it, basically, uh -huh, then you're going to get this sort of thing. But apart from that, it seemed to be more style than anything else. It's a kind of R&B style, which is associated with um, American music more. So it seemed to be that that was the problem. And I asked a voice coach um, about accents and so on and accent training and what have you. Um, and we talked about this to some extent, um, but we talked about the issue to do with what happens when people go to accent uh, or not accent schools, when people go to acting schools in Britain. Um, and to start with, she said that RP, received pronunciation, is referred to by some British actors as true voice. Um, well, clearly it's just a voice. It's not true voice and it's not going to be true voice for a person who wasn't born with that, but that's what it's referred to. All students are taught to use it if you go to a professional acting school um, in, in Britain. Um, and this is often at the expense of their own accents. And the, the coach that I spoke to um, comes from Birmingham, which has a West Midlands accent, um, and said that basically her accent was uh, well, beaten out of her is probably too strong a term, but it really was um, a case of you have to be able to lose this accent. Um, actors also need a general American or a North Midwestern rhotic sort of accent. So those are the two main accents that people are trained in. And what she said to me is you've got to reflect what's in the industry. So you have to be able to produce the sort of accents that are used in the industry. And she's talking about the film industry, the theater industry, and the television industry and so on. So what she said is you find that there's also industry type casting and this is prejudicial. So what we find is that the industry is perpetuating these prejudices that people have about the way that people speak. If you come from a BAME background, which is black, um, Asian or minority ethnic, if you come from one of those backgrounds and you're training in a, um, an acting school in Britain, then you're expected to be able to do accents that are associated with those groups. So, for example, you're expected to be able to do multicultural London English Jamaican and South Asian accents because those are the kinds of roles that you're likely to be offered. Um, if you have a Liverpool or a Scouse or a Manchester accent, then these are seen as canny or cheeky characters. Um, if you have a Birmingham, Irish or Yorkshire accent, then these are seen as sort of funny characters, humorous characters. And if you, are, if you have one of those accents and you're not able to get rid of it, then you are going to either be typecast or you are going to have difficulty getting work in the industry. Now, we can think of a few actors, for example, who actually live on their accents. Um, so uh, people like uh, Sir Michael Caine, for example, has a particular sounding accent and he's always got that accent in just about everything that I've seen him in. He doesn't change it at all. Um, Sean Connery, who um, sadly died very recently, um, was Bond, um, but in that he was Scottish sounding. In every other role he played, he was Scottish sounding. In Highlander, where he's supposed to be an Egyptian, he was Scottish sounding and the Scottish character was played by somebody from France. So that was, that was interesting. Um, so he didn't change his accent, but he always got work. But you have to be a very sort of high profile person for this to be the case. Otherwise, you find that you either end up in those sorts of roles or you just you just don't get work because that is what the industry is looking for. All right, I'm going to move on a bit to prejudice in English as a global lingua franca. And just to remind everybody, um, in case you weren't aware, that the first diaspora um, from um, England, from Britain to uh, North America was from 1607. And uh, then the second, uh, sorry, this is also the first diaspora um, to Australia from um, 1770. So we're looking at um, instances where the British settled in large numbers in these um, countries. And of course, the assumption was that nobody else of any value was there. 
and so we're going to have this land we're going to do what we want with it we might sort of negotiate a bit at the start but actually we're not going to do that we're going to push you into particular regions like we saw the um, Anglo-Saxons doing in um, in England um, and we are going to impose our language on you. So this is um, large numbers of settlers. We also have the second diaspora, which is where you don't get the British or other European powers settling in large numbers, in large numbers, but the regions become protectorates or colonies. And we can see this is colonialism in 1914 with the red color being Great Britain, but we've also got Belgium on there, we've got France, um, etc. So if it's, if it's the English language we're looking at, English is used in government, education and the law. So if you want to be represented in any kind of way, if you want to be educated, then you have to be able to use the language of the colonizers and other languages are marginalized. This is a map of um, South Asia and Southeast Asia. We've got the sort of pinky color there is um, Great Britain. We can also see we've got these princely states um, of India, which are British protectorates within the South Asian Peninsula. Um, and we've got some other places which were colonized by France. Um, and we can also see some colonization going on by the Japanese as well up in Korea. Um, and then we've got the Philippines, Manila, etc., uh, which were colonized by the United States. So the colonizers would have taken their language there. Um, again, maybe not settle in large numbers, but that would become a dominant language in the region. So what are the attitudes of colonial powers to the people that they are colonizing? Um, this is a, an extract from the Macaulay Minute. Uh, Macaulay was a British politician um, and uh, he's talking about India. So this is a, an extract from the Macaulay Minute. And he says, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals and in intellect. To that class, we may leave it to define the vernacular dialects of the country, to enrich those dialects with terms of science borrowed from Western nomenclature, and to render them by degrees fit vehicles for conveying knowledge to the great mass of the population. I mean, I look at this, this just horrifies me, um, quite frankly. At the time, it was kind of what you did, and that doesn't excuse it. But this is the attitude that colonial powers had, uh, whether we're looking at the British here or other um, colonial powers to the indigenous people. And this, this is perpetuated. And again, it's prejudice. It's something that was learned. People were told that the uh, colonized peoples with the other languages were savages, for example. Um, and the fact that India had um, a, a rich uh, literature, um, etc., and science and so on, all of this was swept aside because European powers were, or perceived themselves to be more important. And this is perpetuated through something called linguistic imperialism, which is the transfer of a dominant language to other people. And this is a demonstration of political, economic, and social and military power. And what we find is that even after the colonizers had left, so after the British left, English educated elites still use English and a variety of English, which is close to RP in the case of British settled areas, um, to impose this power on other languages, which are still marginalized. And if you speak, other languages or if you speak English with um, an accent that's affected by another language then you are considered to be a substandard speaker of English. Um, and this came to the fore in a 2018 Guardian article um, looking at Miss USA who um, criticised or mocked some of her rivals English speaking skills. She even said that Miss Cambodia had no English. Wow! Um, 
of course there are people who don't speak English. It's utterly ridiculous to expect that everybody in the world speaks English. And I think there's a very, very slim chance that um, Miss USA spoke Cambodian, for example. Um, and this was referred to in the, um, in the comments on the Instagram account as normalized xenophobia. It's just something that is so widespread that people don't even think of it as a problem. So we have this continued use of English being a linguistic advantage to um, Anglophone people, to speakers of older varieties. So um, we, and I'm counting myself in that, benefit disproportionately from this widespread, diverse Anglophone world that we've got now. And for many, it removes the perceived burden of learning other languages. And I have learned other languages. I'm not fluent in any other languages. And personally, I'm horrified about that but I have learned other languages and I've learned about other cultures um, but there are many people who don't and this just results in a lack of understanding um, of global and social cultural practices and again leads to prejudice. Um, now just a quick um, couple of slides about English in Europe. Um, as you know we are um, we've left Europe. Um, English is a very, very dominant language in Europe. It's the second language of the majority of um, speakers in um, Europe. And there's this thing called Euro-English, um, which according to Zeidlhofer declares itself independent and serves the EU ideal of integration and free movement, which is hilarious, quite frankly, as we've written the, the language, the place that the language, the most recent version of the language has come from is cutting itself off from the EU. I just think this is utterly ridiculous. Anyway, um, Zeidelhofer and colleagues claim that this is a true lingua franca. And in the context of Brexit, the British Council did a report looking at um, these countries, at the projection of um, the need for English language um, in, um, in these countries up until 2025. And their headline findings was that the total number of potential English language learners was going to fall, not because people are not using English, um, but because people are moving into the adult population with higher levels of English. So they said there'd be a continued need for employees who have high level English language skills, um, but they need to top up throughout their lives. They also said that people are looking for much more flexible, personalized and time efficient ways of learning English. They don't want to go to regular classes every week, for example. And they also said that older learners will be a source of demand for English language learning for various reasons, including things like travel and visiting family in other countries. So what are the conclusions from this? First of all, judge a person by what they say and what they do, and don't judge them by how they say it. They might have a wonderfully upper, cl up, upper class RP or general American accent, Judge them by what they're saying and doing, not actually how they say it, what accent they're saying it in. Also, accent prejudices must be addressed in unconscious bias training. This is absolutely vital and they tend not to be. Um, and for English language teachers, I'd say we must prevent the unintentional spread of learned prejudices. We also need to expose our learners to a variety of voices, not just the prestige ones. And we need to equip learners with the tools to listen analytically, very important, and also with accommodation skills so that you can um, accommodate to a way um, your interlocutor is speaking. Um, so that's all I have to say. I'm a little tiny bit over, but um, thank you again very, very much for having me. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Setter. It was really a great pleasure to listen to all of this. And I will just move on to the questions for you. We have a couple of questions. The okay. first one is, would you say that some accents tend to be perceived as a different language given their level of intelligibility when communicating with other accents? Um, as a different language, I mean, you know, this is a political issue in many cases. So whether or not something is, a, is a, an accent or a dialect or a language, um, it's, it's very often um, to do with, you know, borders and, and politics and so on. 
Um, so I, I think that's actually quite a complex thing to answer. I mean, certainly you could say that something was a different variety, um, whether or not you'd say it was a different language. Um, I think we'd have to look at how that was operating within the region of the world that it was in, what it was doing and so on. But, you know, there, there are languages which are mutually intelligible as well, which are classified as different languages and and some which are um, supposedly belong to one language group which are very very different so um, I, think, I think that's actually quite a complex thing to answer from the point of view of global Englishes um, it, it's been it's been proposed that um, from an accent point of view things are going to um, differ so much that it might be difficult to for people to understand each other in different varieties of English it's already difficult to be quite frank. I mean, if I'm listening to somebody from Britain who's from a, a different area of the country um, who has quite a strong regional accent, it's very difficult for me to understand them until I've sort of tuned into them. Um, but that's that's an accent. It's not usually considered a language. I don't know if that answers the question. Is that good enough? I think so. Yeah, thank you so much. And the other question is, can you please comment on the change in the words we use to describe people who learn English slash become English speakers, meaning non-native speakers, English language learners, also people who are emerging bilingual, multilingual, translinguals. Do you have a preferred term? Um, I don't. Um, I find this a minefield, quite frankly. Um, it's very difficult to know which terms to use. Um, so often you end up using a particular term like native speaker, non-native speaker, and then qualifying it. Um, but I mean, th this has been attempted so many times to try and avoid this, um, th the use of the term native speaker and non-native speaker, because they just don't really capture the situation. Have they ever? I, I, I don't really know if they have. I think um, Jenkins' book on global Englishes um, goes into this in some to some extent, talking about people being monolingual English speakers or bilingual English speakers, that that sort of thing. If you're looking at it from an English perspective, so you could adopt that sort of approach, um, and then non-bilingual English speakers, where people are not fully bilingual. Although I think you know even that's an evolving system. So. Um, I think if you're if you're writing a thesis and trying to decide what to use, I think you have to plump for um, one set of terms or another. But it's it's going to have to be qualified these days um, because it's it's just such a minefield, such a difficult area. Again, I don't really think I've answered the question, but uh, anyway. Well, thank you so much for the answer. We have another question from John Levis, who is another great pronunciation professor. Indeed so the is. question is, uh, to what extent do non-prestige accents affect the ways that language learners perceive a teacher's suitability for teaching pronunciation? Can language learners actually tell the difference between accents? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if they can, to be honest. Um, I mean, I think if you told learners that your teacher had a non-prestige accent, that would immediately create a problem. Um, but I mean, I mean, you know, there's been there's been work that uh, that the matched guys technique, for example, which looked at one speaker of British English producing the same passage in a variety of different British accents. When British people were asked to um, rate them on a number of different attributes. Um, there was one skewedness. Uh, when people from outside the UK were asked to do this, they didn't have the same um, inherent prejudices coming up with these accents at all. So, um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the important thing is that you are teaching your learners to be understood. Um, and so they need to be clearly spoken. Um, and I'd recommend that um, they were uh, taught in a variety which was um, going to be clear to a wide majority of people um, but as to whether somebody could um, pick up the nuance of somebody coming from one area of a country or another area of a country I, I think I, I don't think unless you were told that this person didn't speak a prestige variety I think it might be difficult unless you just couldn't understand them in which case that would be um, that would be more of a problem but yeah again this is uh, this is a really, really interesting issue because people just don't perceive, they don't have the same prejudices outside of, of a very local environment. Um, uh, unless you're a, a British English speaker in which you seem to have prejudices about just about anybody that speaks English, quite frankly. 
Okay, thank you. There's another question. What is your take on the future of English? There have been suggestions that in countries like India, there are now more number of English language speakers than in other parts of the world. Is there merit in thinking about how we can make indigenous varieties of English official in those countries rather than using RP or American English as the unrealistic reference points in English language education? You know, I would love this, but it's political. It's a political problem. It's the people that hold the power and the people who decide on the language policies that have to be persuaded for, for, for this. And I think the, the pronunciation community, um, including all of us, um, are working very hard in, in that regard. But unless you can convince somebody who already has um, a position um, or doesn't want to change something because it's too much like hard work, um, then I, I think it's it's an issue. And, and also, I mean, I, I wrote a book on Hong Kong English and um, as an emergent variety of English and went to Hong Kong as part of the promotion for this. Actually, I think I was there for some other reason, but I did some promotion for the book while I was there. And the people who were most resistant to the idea of Hong Kong English being a bona fide variety were um, local Chinese um, teachers of English who said, no, Hong Kong English is just wrong, it's incorrect. So if you've got that sort of attitude, um, if people are holding themselves up against um, a standard like British or American English, and it's difficult to shift that, then to change the policy would, would be very, very hard, I think. Um, it's possible that all this kind of unsettling political stuff that's going on at the moment in the world could have a bearing on this. Um, but maybe it's more likely to skew language learning in the direction of other languages rather than in the direction of different varieties or more local varieties, um, who knows. But certainly um, from, a, from a World English's point of view, from a pronunciation point of view, I don't think any of the people that are writing on pronunciation would disagree about having a, a local standard. But again, it would have to be something that could be understood by a majority of English speakers because that's generally what English speakers want. They don't want to be using it at home. They want to be using it with people from all over the world. Um, so it would have to not stray too far out of the remit of something that was clearly understood by um, a wide group of people, or it would have to become a more dominant variety in the world generally, which more people were exposed to and, and understood. That's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. There's another interesting question. Um, coming from central Canada, we sometimes hear that this region has a neutral accent that is highly comprehensible. Is this a valid kind of categorization? No accent is neutral. Um, highly comprehensible is a different matter. You may have a highly comprehensible um, variety, but there is absolutely no variety whatsoever that's neutral. You <laughs> Can people be neutral? It's impossible to say it. it yeah, it, no, neutral, no, highly intelligible, great, neutral. Uh, uh. Yeah, other people say they agree with you um, here in the chat box. And the last question will be, how is the accentism reflected in the teaching of English for L2 or L1 learners, L1 English speakers in the UK? Do British students learn RP variety in their English classes? Um, I think there's been a, a change to some extent. Um, the majority of materials, um, I would say, still tend to have um, standardish type accents, maybe with a flavour of things from different varieties. So you would tend to get um, a, a standard southern or a standard um, standard northern type accent that didn't stray too far away. Um, from um, what you'd think of as a traditional native speaker, if we're allowed to use that term. Um, but, you know, we've got a variety of people in the classroom actually teaching English. So um, people are going to be, if they come to Britain to learn English, they're going to be exposed to other varieties of English as well. Um, from a testing point of view, uh, I mean, again, this is another tricky area, but um, from a testing point of view, um, my understanding is that IELTS, for example, um, that uh, for the spoken language test, there's less um, emphasis placed on nearness to an idealized RP native speaker um, and more emphasis now placed on how intelligible you are, how clearly able you are to communicate. 
Um, but I understand that that varies quite a lot depending on the examiner. Um, and again, uh, just from anecdotal discussions with um, colleagues, it seems that the examiners that want to be closer or want the, the speakers to be closer to um, old fashioned type standard varieties tend to be people um, from um, those countries. So like the teachers I was talking about from Hong Kong, they tend to have a, a stronger view about um, local varieties not being correct. So, so we've got a kind of a, a mismatch going on. It seems that um, some groups of teachers are much more open to intelligibility, comprehensibility um, than others. And how you police this, I think is, is tricky. I don't actually know how you police it. So, yeah. Yeah, and related to that, Beata said, I wonder whether the pandemic will change anything and that we don't know. Well, yeah, who knows? I mean, if it manages to wipe out, wipe out all the Brits and Americans, then that's a chance. <laughs> who knows? We, we just don't know, do we? We've got no idea. And, and again, it's this whole sort of uh, political issue, how countries are viewed. Um, if, if, a, if a country is viewed negatively or if it goes down in influence in the world, then this is going to have an effect on which languages are spoken ultimately. Um, and uh, I mean, you, I, I have a colleague called Lynn Murphy who does an excellent talk called How America Saved the English Language. Um, and, and really it did, because at the time that Britain, the, the empire was on the decline, that's when the political power of the United States was really coming to the fore. Are we now seeing that um, that power, for various reasons that might have relevance this week, um, is you know no longer seen so positively in the world, um, which might have an effect on the way that languages are chosen um, and spoken. So yeah, who knows? Good question. Yeah, and I think accent will always be an issue, no matter what. Well, oh, I absolutely. think we do not. Yeah, I think we do not have any other questions, but thank you very much on behalf of everyone. This was great, Dr. Setter, and um, hopefully we can have you again in the future for another great webinar. Thank you so much. And um, this is the end of the webinar. And would you like to add something before we close it? Um, not really. I'd just like to say, yes, I, actually I would. Um, thank you so much again for having me. Um, I very much appreciate it. It was it was good to have the opportunity to, to speak to people. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to say, remind everybody, prejudices are learned. They are learned. They are things that we learn from our peers. They are not inherent. They do not have any basis on reality whatsoever. And um, as language teachers, I think it is our job to try and make sure that we are removing this unconscious bias that people have or conscious bias that people have about languages in the in the industry as much as we can. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Setter, and thank you very much to everyone. Hopefully you will have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in what, whatever time zone. And we hope to see you in our next webinar. Thank you so much. You may disconnect now. <laughs>